to the know. In the know, be free. I'd love to, uh, you know, get some kind of practical tips on, on how to determine next steps, how to continue mind training uh, without like making like this plan for the future and keep, like people say, keep putting stuff off to the future. Like this next year I'm going to do this, and the year after I'm going to do this, and get closer and closer and closer without ever getting there. So just how do you make those choices? How do you make those decisions and if you don't feel super clear with guidance? I always like to say that, that the Holy Spirit is the how, and we're accustomed, because we've been taught and we've been thinking in linear terms, when we think of the how, we usually associate it with, with a specific formula, some kind of methodology, <coughs> some kind of means, you know, that's just the way that we were raised. It doesn't matter what family we were raised in, uh, it's, it's almost like the common language of the world. You know, if somebody has an idea like, oh, uh, a new house, or a vacation, or a cruise, or something, then that's the, that's kind of like the destination, or the idea, and then the means are tied into the how. And, um, I got, a, I started to get a clue that I had to let go of that kind of thinking. When I was in University of Cincinnati, I was in a five-year program in urban planning and we were always learning how to assess and collect data and then to project into the future. And then if you get into A Course in Miracles, you get into like Lesson 135. A healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. It's like the total opposite of this linear way of thinking. I was in engineering for a year, I was in urban planning for five years, so the first six years of university were, were very much in this linear mode. If you're going to build a bridge, you got to look at stress points and weight and all kinds of factors. If you're going to do urban planning and you have to do infrastructure for a city and you've got communications and all types of utilities and people and and all kinds of factors to consider and then to project into the future, to plan for the future, to plan for future growth. And then basically when you get to Lesson 135, it's almost like Jesus has put a total reverse on the whole thing. And he's saying, you can have this glorious, glorious state of of like, like divine providence and trust and innocence as long as you don't do one of three things, he's just basically say, say don't do and don't do these three things, and you're you are set for glory. And the three things that he mentions in that lesson 135 is he says, don't activate the past. That's one. Don't activate the past. Don't organize the present, and don't plan the future. <laughs> It's like everything that I learned in university, he's just given three things and he's saying, don't, don't, and don't. He's saying, do only that. Live as me. Live in joy. Live in peace. Live in bliss. Live in happiness. And if you really want to live like me and live in me and through me, don't activate the past, don't organize the present, and don't plan the future. So, when you get into next steps, I would say those three uh, mechanisms have to really be operating. If those were like three plates, you want those three plates spinning. Oh, I'm not going to activate the past, organize the present, or plan the future. And I do remember back when I was in university, I think right after my degree in urban planning, I actually started going to the library and and I kept being drawn to these three sections of the library that were real close to each other. Of philosophy, psychology, and religion. I guess kept out of the whole university. I mean, I've been in calculus and science and conservatory of music and art and done so many things, but I was drawn to those three sections. And it just kept 
drawing me more and more inward. And I remember going to the psychology section. I was reading, about, you know, of course, B.F. Skinner and Freud and all the different ones. But I was really struck by Abraham Maslow. He's the guy who came up with the hierarchy of needs and at the top of the pyramid was self-actualization, which for me was like self-realization and these higher being needs. You had to meet the basic needs first, you know, your basic needs for survival and then you had needs, you know, it, it, for esteem and so on and so forth and then you worked your way up to being needs. So I was fascinated by the being needs, the meta needs. I was looking at the top of the pyramid. I was fascinated that, that actually there was an evolution in human consciousness that would result in self-actualization. And so he studied the most self-actualized people he could find, both living and deceased, to find his research for this. And the interesting thing that he found was that for those that were in, in really the self-actualization state of mind, that means and end were the same. That means and end were actually joined together. Almost like in the Course, cause and effect are together. The Father and the Son are together. Means and ends are together. And the more I read about it, it was like, I said, what does that even mean? Means and ends are together. I mean, I can't even... I, I'm so used to thinking of means coming before the end that I could hardly imagine what that would even mean. Means and end are together. Like, you know, like the destination is now. Like you are right here and right now and everything that you even need to experience, this experience is given to you simultaneously that the means are given with the end. And uh, Jenny was mentioning the other day that she was saying that it's, you're not really afraid of the means, you're afraid of the end. <coughs> it's like, where is this heading is the scary part. If you could just really give in and accept where this is all heading, then the means would be poof, like right there. But it's the resistance to where it's heading you know, that, that makes the means difficult to discover, and hence the question about next steps. You know, you think about all this, sometimes the, please give me a sign, make it clear, and how do I do this? You know, how can I get from A to B? And he's kind of saying, well, A and B are actually the same point. And when you, when you put it off into the future, it's, it is very difficult to to put that together, to formalize it, to have a formula, because you still are seeing the means as apart from the end. That these people who were self-actualized, they seem to have no concern about the end and form or outcome. Like, for example, a musician who is, is so in the divine flow uh, of performing, whatever they're performing, or the singer, or the athlete, or you know, the athlete in the zone is the same thing, that there's such a joy in the moment for the athlete who's having that experience, that there's no sense of setting a record, or bettering a performance, or, you know, achieving something that nobody else has ever achieved. It's, there's such a sense of contentment, like, wow, this is so great. It's like, it's like the experience is the end. It's, you're right in the middle of the end. It's not coming. Like the painter who's painting a painting and is just so into the glory of the painting, the verb painting, that there's no thought of, of how the picture will end up, or if the picture will be sold, or if it will be, become famous, like a Rembrandt, you know, or so it's, you know, there's no thought of that. And I think children experience this too, when they're playing, they're so into the play that they don't think about the end of the play, or what's coming after the play. They're all consumed, all absorbed in the playing. It's that joyful moment. So, in my experience, I find that the Holy Spirit uses the things that you seem to learn, the skills, the abilities, the things that you seem to learn, and and uses those skills and abilities 
in a way that take you into the present moment. Like, you know, you are a PE teacher, physical education, and I went through, I mean, I, I particularly, that was probably one of my favorite um, subjects <laughs> in high school, if it be known, I, I enjoyed that. And then when I got into my 20s, um, there was a lot of people that were into yoga, I wasn't. There was a lot of people that went to Tai Chi. I wasn't. I was into basketball and tennis and a lot of golf. Um, I wasn't into special diets or special postures, lotus positions, and you know, I was just not into a lot of those kind of things. But but the spirit was like very well. Well, we can see that you have a passion for tennis. So, Timothy Galway, the inner game of tennis, oh, the zen of tennis, oh, that feels really good. I want to I wanna zoom in and let the tennis skills be used as part of my mind training, my consciousness expansion. And golf, you know, getting out there and just playing on the golf course, oftentimes alone, but I would just kind of sink into this deep relaxation where it would be like, oh, let the spirit play golf through me. And then when I would really relax, then that, that click of the club hitting the ball, that perfect click, and the ball would go up and have this nice backspin on it and push, hit on the green and push, come back. And I, I would just love everything about a, it was like a Tiger Woods stroke, you know, just click and then watch and then sh and and got into the rhythm of that. In basketball, I would just got, be able to lose a sense of a personal self just into the rhythm of that, where you could just get into such a rhythm where it was like it was playing through you. Your shots was, it was no rim, just swish, 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 a rhythm. There was a rhythm there, like the rhythm underneath this world, and just using that. I remember one time telling a girlfriend, when I was in my late 20s, you know, I think I found God on the tennis court. And she was a fundamentalist Christian. She's like, oh, don't be ridiculous. You've got to go to church but to find God. I said, I think I discovered God on the, ten on the tennis court because I would be out there for like three hours at a time and a friend of mine I would play with would would be like, uh, he was into Kriya Yoga and tennis, and I was into Course in Miracles and tennis, and we would get out into the Zen of tennis, where we would just get into these rhythms. And I'd swear if you were filming it, after a while, this went on for months and months and months, it looked like Jimmy Connors and Bjorn Borg having a rally. <coughs> we would have these long rallies, we would be able to spin the ball, come around the post, and top spin lobs, and we were slicing it, and top spinning it, and doing, and we would just get into this whir of joy that would just go on and on and on and on. So much so that even he called me up in Cincinnati in the middle of winter, and there was like seven inches of snow out there. And he said, are you ready for a little bit of TPT, transpersonal tennis, <laughs> where we go out and transcend the personal? And I'd say, okay. He said, you got a snow shovel? I said, I do. And I said, better bring your gloves though. It's like, it's a wind chill of like minus 10 out there and six inches of the snow. So we go out on the tennis court and we would shovel the tennis court and we'd have these piles of snow and everything and we'd have our hats and gloves on and everything. And he had a big mustache and a big beard and his, his nose was running and it was like icicle, icicle snot, you know, on there and on the, we'd be out there. We'd just lose track of the body, lose track of, of everything, lose track of the minus whatever 10 degrees wind chill, and we would get into the rhythm. The balls would only come like this far <laughs> off the ground, so all of our knees bending, all of our techniques had to be just emphasized so we could even continue. We'd just get into the zone at minus 10 uh, out there rallying, and we'd even do a little bit of the Boris Becker, you know, we'd a real wide angle ball, we could go flying off way off knowing we would land in a pile of snow. <laughs> so instead of doing the Boris Becker thing and scraping up the knees and everything, we would go sailing 10 feet out of the court with one final whack. <laughs> you know, just like two kids playing. But the spirit was using our skills and our love of sports 
and using them in a way to train our mind. So that's how the Holy Spirit works. You know, when we loved what we were doing and we were allowed to use whatever it was that we had, we didn't have to relearn a bunch of new skills. We just took, the Holy Spirit took our skills and I had always loved baseball and softball and all these sports, so instead of getting into a lot of things that are seen as more as spiritual movement disciplines or meditation disciplines, it just, that's how glorious the Holy Spirit is. But, but you could see that it was taking us more to do not activate the past, organize the present, or plan the future. Quickly, when we played tennis, we were like, keeping score you know, was like, why would we keep score? We're just into this glorious rhythm of the zone, and the zone, we couldn't even think of the score. You know, if we tried to keep score, it, it, it literally went out. Um, and it was the same with golf, you know, I just would get into the rhythms, and, and with everything I would do, I would, get, I would get into the mind training, and get into the zone, and to the present moment with it. And uh, there was a point at the end of that where my friend, I think he was up, at the time, I think he was up into his 40s, and, and the skill level went so high that he was tempted. He said to me at one point, he said, you know, I'm going to start entering tournaments. I'm going to start beating some of these teens and these 20-year-old phenoms. You know, and I just said, I, well, I'm off the ride there, because I absolutely had no inkling of, of, of using it for competitive uh, purposes. I was just like so devoted to just living in that moment that I could see that the Course was teaching me that I needed to use it for that that flow and that expression and for nothing else. There's a line in the Course, Jesus says, never underestimate your need to be vigilant against the idea of competition. Competition obliterates the, the zone, the moment from the mind and, and so I was all into the skills, I loved the skills and the sports, but, but the competitive aspects of it, you know, this was just taking me more like Gandhi in a very non-violent, uh, peaceful direction uh, opposed to that. So I said, well, do whatever you need to do, and he would go out and enjoy beating younger, you know, tennis players, whatever, but I just could never get into that. And I think it's been that way with the Course, you know, the more I got into it, I just got so into the experience of the presence and the connection that, that everything else, you know, when people would talk about, you know, you could do workshops and books and all these different things, and I thought, well, the Course is such a masterpiece, I just couldn't imagine, like, spending my life writing books with such a masterpiece already there. I wanted to practice it and live it, but I wasn't interested in making a career out of it, even A Course in Miracles career, Jesus was saying, no, you've done that before, in the past, this will be different, you know, we're going for the awakening here, we're going fully into the experience, and don't be distracted by any other thing that the ego tries to throw up as an alluring uh, aspect of the world, you know, we want to go all the way inward to the Kingdom of Heaven here. So, in answer to your question, when you are aware that you don't want to activate the past, organize the present, or plan the future, and you just come together and join in the state of presence, that's what usually happens, it can happen at the end of a retreat, or oftentimes we would do these devotionals of, of ten days, or two weeks, or three weeks, where people would come with us and just immerse into this deepening experience, and then at the end, the next steps would be more of just like a joining in prayer, and just listening. And oftentimes it, it comes very spontaneous. Um, I'm thinking of one friend of ours, uh, Armel's husband, Eric, um, at the end of a devotional, um, back a while back, he came to me and he had been a hypnotherapist, and um, he had a house in Texas, and, and a career, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the devotional, he came to me to join in Next Steps. And, uh, well, we prayed, and uh, he was very sincere in wanting to just be open to the Next Steps, and, uh, and 
I prayed and then the, I heard one word and that was uh, minstrel and then it kind of had a traveling feel like a traveling minstrel and I remember Eric when I said the word to him he said what is that <laughs> you know he he played the guitar and he had I could feel all these songs in him that were to come through and, and really spectacular songs and he'll be here at Strawberry Fields forever you know in about a month playing but but it was like minstrel he had to go to the dictionary to look it up and then when he did he was like wow yeah yeah that's it in that moment the whole <laughs> hypnotherapy career the house <laughs> and everything really went uh, even though it took a little time to just quickly say, resign from the career and to sell the house, to play it out. It was a moment of the minstrel idea came in and it was just like, yeah, I totally feel it. And then after that, all these songs came from the Holy Spirit. He was literally given the songs, he was given the travel, and he was given Armel. <laughs> uh, it was quite a, he was like, wow, it was a really big change for him in his life. Because he was kind of safe in his career, and safe, and he, he could feel like two big things were coming in his life, and the first was this minstrel, traveling minstrel thing, and the second was Armel. It was the undoing of Eric. It was like, if he was a submarine, he got hit by two torpedoes <laughs> right in the bow. Boom! Boom! And, there's, and really there's... To this day, there's not much left of Eric. I mean, it's, it just... It, but you see, he could feel it coming, and he was praying for it. He wanted, he wanted to transcend Eric and, and come into the presence. And it took two major torpedoes to really to sink the boat. Uh, but it was, there was no way. <laughs> there's hardly even time to get a life raft out <laughs> after those things. <laughs> Yeah, we always we marveled at it. We would, we would be like, yeah, Eric just needs to get into joy. He needs to get into purpose. He needs to get into function. He knows the course inside out, like the back of his hand. He's pretty much knows it so well. He's like a, he's an intellectual genius with the course, but he needs to get into the joy of function. Boom, traveling minstrel, and he needs to let go of this intellectual approach to the course. Lisa said one time, he needs a really strong woman. He needs a strong woman to like come into his life. And our milk goes, boom, boom. <laughs> and there, now you see him, he's just like, child, he's very childlike. He's got, yeah, he's got really childlike eyes and just play, the songs like rip through him, you know, like a torrent, you know, just from the spirit. He just gets so into it. We all, it would be a treat if you can come to Strawberry Fields just to listen to Eric, you know, it would be a blessing. But, but this is how it happens, you know, that's, that's kind of an example of next steps where it was all underneath there, like in potentiality, ready to happen, and it was just this self-concept, this personality self-concept that was on the surface. It was quite tightly tied down, you know, and, and it was anchored through years of repetition, you know, the career was quite a long career there, in hypnotherapy and and he was paying a mortgage on a house and all the you know the typical things like this and then boom 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 it was totally re reconfigured and and it's like going down the rabbit hole kind of like they talk about in what to bleep he just he was willing to, to dive down you know he had he had never met Armel and Armel had the guidance to get married in 13 15 15 15 days I mean, that's what we mean, here come the torpedo, and he didn't even see it coming. <laughs> he didn't have a chance. <laughs> and it was so beautiful, Armel will tell you it's, it was perfect for her too. It was just the perfect thing. So, that's, that's really kind of what, it, it's like it's already there, it's already underneath, but it's ready to, it's waiting to come out. And generally it will use the skills and abilities that, that you already have, and the interest. It won't, it's not this whole reinventing thing, that the ego likes to reinvent and reinvent and reinvent. Eric already was a very good guitar player, 
he could just go and sit on the corner and play Beatles songs and Eric Clapton and all different kinds and people would gather around him or at a camping at a campground and he had some songs already coming through but then the torrent of songs from the Holy Spirit came through and and the travel and and getting married to Armel, all kinds of things opened up which was part of that loosening. But that's like a good little example, a little prototype of how it, how it works. You know, it uses the skills and abilities. Helena sang in choirs for years, but it wasn't until she got into the joy of purpose and just letting the spirit like sing through her and use it all for mind training that you know, it had been to how many schools were you at? Twenty, twenty something schools, but the last school that she went to was more a reflection of her and her desire to go deep into the intuition. So there was no, like, what things weren't like graded and judged. It was, a, it was like a, a spectacular reflection of wanting to undo education and undo the linear mode of learning and become completely intuitive. So the school was a unique kind of school in Sweden, southern Sweden, completely reflected that back to her, where she could, you could pick your curriculum, it wasn't picked for you. What were some of the classes that you took? Um, film studies at home. <laughs> film studies at home, well I would have loved that one. <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> Metaphysical films that yeah, she loved to watch. Yes. And then meditation class, deserted. Meditation. Yeah. Art. Fire, guitar, even though I just played on one string. She played, she went, she would go to the guitar class and just hit one string over and over and over. Talk about, it's kind of art and medita meditation yeah, combined. And art, and art was also like totally like painting white on white and just being. <laughs> white on white. There's a Zen art class. <laughs> Such that you wouldn't even, couldn't even think of, like, is there really such a school where you can go paint white on white, you can take a guitar lesson, and you just ding, 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 ding. You know, I mean, and she would describe these things, and I'd say, does this, is it really a school that exists like this? But, but it was after 20-some schools, she was through with kind of linear learning, and it was very intuitive. So it used her desire, you know, for awakening, but it used it in a way it was a perfect next step, and singing uh, in front of the class, and learning to let go of all kinds of people pleasing she was working on at the time with all of her classmates, and it just many, many, many glorious things. They even helped you work with some compositions. It wasn't a musical instrumentation at the school for some of your first songs, and later on would would be carried forward. So. That's, that's just another example how the Holy Spirit uses what's in place and it just takes it in a completely different direction. And that's comforting to know, it's, instead of having to think that you just have to completely relearn a bunch of new skills. You know, this is more about exiting uh, the learning of skills and letting the ones that are already learned be used to channelize the mind. When you, when you have the same purpose for so many different skills and they all get channelized in one direction, it's, it helps to unify perception and unify consciousness. And uh, it's great to know for all of us, like even with the acting, you know, that was something when Amanda went into, you know, spirituality, it was like acting, comedy, stand-up, all the different, whatever you've done. When I first talked to her and heard that you were interested in us, that that's back, you probably deleted a lot of them from YouTube or something or whatever, but we, Francis and I, we went on there and we were just laughing and we found all these experiences that you had, all these videos on online and then now it's more of like letting some of that come and integrate back in and giving it to the Holy Spirit, whereas typically sometimes we just say, that's enough. I don't, that's a, that's a time before and I don't need that anymore. It's the same thing I think with Justin, you had so many skills. I have another friend, Ben, who's down in Australia now, he came, he came to the monastery just with so many skills you wouldn't even believe it. And he never told us about any of those skills. He just put on this big long robe 
and he let his beard grow out and his hair grow long, and he, he looked like Moses. It's, he just, like Moses had appeared at the monastery. And it wasn't until later, how long it was pretty much later when Lisa was doing a one-on-one? -on -one. Like a, a year later. She's like talking to Moses and, and all of a sudden we find out Moses is high tech. He works with servers and all kinds of things. He hid it. He said, I wasn't going to tell you because I knew I'd have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a tech genius. And it was like he got his hair cut. It was, like he, it, was, it was like he opened up to just expand and just use everything. It was so beautiful. Yeah, even the short hair. He yeah. was clean shaven and, you know, he, wow, Moses cleans up good. <laughs> He's, he also had some debts, and so he didn't tell about those either. He no. hid, hid about his debts and everything, and then once he exposed that he had these debts, it was like, well, you've been here for like about a year, maybe it's time to open up to the possibility of, of a job. And so he couldn't seem to find his job in Salt Lake City, and then he was standing there, and the wind was blowing this flyer flopping down by his foot. <laughs> yep, that's how he got the job. Uh, the, flyer flopped up to by his foot and he's like, yeah. what's this? And he called this number and he ended up getting a really good job, starting to pay down his debts. And then the Holy Spirit was like, oh, here comes another quickening. You don't even have to pay off all your debts. You, you, know, you may think, well, you're going to have to pay, personally pay off all your debts. No. He met Karen in our community and he got married to Karen. <laughs> That's how... She's selling her house, and that's how the debts are going away. So it's just, you know, it's all kind. It can come from all kinds of angles. If you just have the willingness, and you're thinking with the blinders on, like, oh, I'm going to have to solve all these problems I've set up, the Holy Spirit's like, no, if you give yourself over to be used by me, the Spirit says, you know, I will handle everything else and help you clear away the obstacles so that you can be a full service you know, to the whole universe, to yourself and the whole universe. <laughs> and we have so many examples of that. You know, if you talk to the volunteers, you know, some of the long-term volunteers, you'll hear the stories of the unraveling, of the undoing, of all the miracles, and unexpected things that come in, but still this, those previous skills are very often used in glorious ways. It's like the Holy Spirit's like, I'm not going to waste that. <laughs> you know, you know, servers, <laughs> we have MMT program, <laughs> mystical mind training, we need somebody who can handle the servers, or with this or that. And even how this whole place was built, this is like probably 10 or 12 years of miracles. Before we got it, Suzanne was here and there were many miracles, that's how a lot of this was built, very miraculously, as an eclectic retreat center, including A Course in Miracles, and now the monastery has just continued on as kind of an international Course in Miracles monastery, but there's been so many miracles and collaborations involved in everything that we perceive around us. And you can feel the vibe of it at least, even if you don't see the whole, you know, film of how it happened, you can still feel the vibe and the energy of all the collaboration that was used for mind training. And, yeah, it's cool. That's how it, that's a glimpse, that's how it works. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>